This evening's scripture reading will be from Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Good evening, everyone. So glad to see you all back this evening. Uh, thank God for another lovely day. You see that rain out there? God knew I'd need rain for the grass to grow. <laughs> so I could cut it. So I'm thankful for it. My, my plan's coming together. Since I've uh, been having a few health problems, I have been told that I need to eat more fruit. So I've been uh, trying different ones, some of which I'm familiar with, and, and, and some I just, uh, well, I'm trying to adjust to. <laughs> but we're all familiar with the idea of fruit. And when we become Christians, God expects us, according to Romans 8, 29, to become conformed to the image of his son. We as Christians are changing, hopefully, to be more like Christ the longer we remain Christians. You find out that there's some things that you need to change to be more Christ-like, and this goes on as long as we live. The message this evening is entitled, Fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit. Now, you can't get fruit unless you get seed. Because that's where the fruit comes from. Let us turn to Luke chapter 8. And the verse is 11. We all know it as the parable of the soul. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God, stop. We don't have to wonder where the seed comes from for this fruit that we are commanded to have. We know that the spirit of God has given us God's word. And that as we receive and obey God's word, then it is planted in us and cultivated and it begins to bear fruit. Now, if that's not how it happens, something is wrong. Let's look at 1 Peter 1 and the verse is 23. That threw me when I first obeyed the gospel. Because I noticed that Christians were changing. They would be doing something and then they would, they would say, well, no, we don't do that anymore because of this scripture or because of that scripture. And as they learn to do better, they actually change to fit the scripture. First Peter 1, and I'll start at verse 22, seeing ye have purified 
your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brother, and see that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. The world's going to pass away, but God's word never will. Now you don't have to have good fruit, but we should as Christians. In fact, if we're going to be pleasing to God, the fruit must be good. He warns us of some folks, tells us that uh, we can tell a tree by the fruit it bears. Say a good tree cannot produce evil fruit, and an evil tree cannot produce good fruit. And we know if it's going to please God, it's got to be that fruit that's good. But look what he does in John, the 15th chapter, beginning with verse 1. We have several analogies in the Bible that explain how we become more and more Christ-like. And the more I learn about the Bible, the more I realize that this is not necessarily a, a easy process. Jesus said in John 15 and 1, I am the vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, being in lawn and landscaping, I'm familiar with this scripture because every January, you're supposed to cut them grapevines back. And when you do so, they'll produce more fruit. The Bible is letting us know that God, through his word, is going to prune away some things that don't need to be there in our lives. And when these things are pruned, that we will bear more fruit. He also makes the analogy of, of purifying us as in purifying precious metals. And I can't help but notice that that Certain impurities come out at certain temperatures. The closer to us the impurity is, the harder the fire's got to be in order to get rid of that impurity. Look at verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. God expects us to bear fruit. It's not something that we have a choice about. Now, here's the thing. People grow just as children grow at different rates. And as such, they produce fruit at different rates. And so, we shouldn't be, they don't do nothing. They just, they're going at their pace, and you're going at your pace. I think about the, the parable of the beam and the moat. Get that board out of your eye before you look over there at your brother and try to get the splinter out of his eye. <laughs> I 
Luke 13, beginning with verse 6. Is my next scripture. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I have dug around it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. What's our Lord and Savior telling us here? He's letting us know that we don't all bear not only fruit at the same rate, but we don't always bear the same type of fruit. Some people might excel in one area, and some people might excel in others. But all make no mistake, God expects us all to bear fruit. And though He be patient with us in our fruit bearing, at some point, yes, He expects us to bear fruit. I believe it's... Uh, Matthew, the third chapter, where the Bible speaks of, in the tenth verse, Now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees, therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I don't have to tell you what fire that is. It ain't the campfire. <laughs> and so, we need to understand that in order to have spiritual fruit, it's the result of spiritual growth. When you come up to a tree, you just see the fruit. In other words, if we do what we're supposed to as far as studying God's word and applying God's word in our lives, we don't have to worry about the fruit part. The fruit part is what people see in our lives from our growth. Look at Psalms 1 and the verses 1. We all know it. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. That's another thing. We, we, we are not obligated to listen to people we know who are speaking and teaching false doctrine. We don't have to do that. In fact, we're commanded in the Bible to not only choose carefully what we hear, but how we hear it. We don't walk in the counsel of ungodly. No, what you asking them for? They don't know. They don't know nothing about the great counselor, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They don't know nothing from his word. They can't help you. They can mess you up. 
But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. What would be the result? And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Here we go. That bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. It took me a long time to understand and realize if I just do what it is God said to do, then he would take care of the rest. Now, I, don't, I ain't telling you to be like the farmer. Lord, keep the weeds out my crop. Lord, them blessing with a tractor, cultivators, plows, everything he need to keep the weeds out his crop, but he won't Get out there and do it. I ain't telling you to be like him. But what I am telling you is when you put God first, God makes everything else possible. I heard a saying on the radio one time, and uh, I don't know. They, I, I haven't heard it in a while. I don't know whether the guy still says it or not. But he said, faith would have no merit if reason provided proof. Therefore, keep the faith. That's a good thing for Christians to understand. We walk by faith, not by sight. That's another way of what, saying what he was saying. If we could see our way out, that wouldn't be require faith, would it? Let us look at Ephesians 5. And the verse is 8. If we concentrate on growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through his word that the Spirit has inspired man to write, then we will have the fruit that the Bible speaks of. Ephesians 5 and the verse is 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Here we go, number 10. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Proving it how, Brother Robinson? Proving it from his word. Prove all things. Hold fast. That which is good. So as we. Partake of the seed. And as the seed takes root and. Germinates and is cultivated. And we began to grow spiritually. Ephesians 5, beginning with verse 22, tells us what there should be more and more of in our lives. Now you say, Brother Robinson, you didn't, you didn't say anything about the works of the flesh. That's why they call them the works of the flesh. They need no introduction. <laughs> We're all in the flesh. We don't need to know how to cultivate them. That's that natural man, that brutish man. What we need to work on begins in verse 22. The fruit of the spirit. Now, for time's sake, I'm not going to try to go through all these and explain them all, but I'm going to touch on them. 
Ephesians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is. Hold it right there. Ain't no mystery. If we don't see these things, there ain't no fruit. Number one is love. We're to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbors as ourselves. The Bible tells us that the world will know we are the Lord's disciple when we have love one for another. Joy. God wants us to be the happiest people on the earth. In Philippians 4 4, the Bible tells us rejoice. And again I say, rejoice. We ought to be happy, folks. Why? Because we know why we're here. We're fulfilling the purpose for which God put us here. And we have a heavenly home if we remain faithful unto death when we leave here. Will we be perfect? No. But when we fall down, get up. Peace. And I like what Isaiah 26 and 3 says. Turn there with me if you will. Isaiah 26. And verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Whose mind is stayed on thee. Why? Because he trusted in thee. We ought to have the Lord tells us he'll give us that peace that passes all understanding. He is the God of peace. Long suffering. As opposed to short suffering. <laughs> Sometimes we don't want to suffer. We just don't want to suffer very long now. <laughs> but God is long suffering with us. Not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. He gives us time. I'm so glad he gave me time. And I'm so glad he still gives me time. Ephesians 4 and verse 1. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech ye that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, putting up with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Do you see why where these characteristics will make us like a large boulder who has seen seasons come and go and though we be old and worn yet we stand there against all the elements and the weather and whatever comes along as we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we're not so easily moved by all these things that happen to us in life because we understand that the Lord's going to see us through. We understand that they're only temporary. And that we have a heavenly home. A place prepared. Made without hands. Kindness. We are to be ye kind 
one to another. Sometimes it ain't what you say, it's how you say it. Faithfulness. We know that if we are faithful unto death, then we will have eternal life. Meekness, and people get this wrong, meekness is strength suffering. I think about Moses, the Bible says he was more meek than any man that was upon the earth. But he led the children of Israel out of bondage. I think about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It wasn't that he didn't have power. He had all power. But he was meek. Meekness is not weakness. And I know the Bible tells us that we are not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. But at the same time. I know that meekness is not an inferiority complex. We are to be meek as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was meek when he was here on this earth. And the last one, temperance, self-control. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. And we continue to die daily to them. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27, I believe, I buffet my body to bring it under subjection. Lest after I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. If we continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, using only the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, to fuel that growth. These are the things that will be able to be seen in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit. If for some reason you have found you have fallen short, or you have not obeyed the gospel of Christ, First, you must hear the gospel. You must believe it. You must repent of your sins. You must confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God with your mouth and be baptized for the remission or removal of your sins. If you have transgressed God's law after obeying the gospel, you too have the opportunity to come become reconciled back to God through repentance, prayer, and confession. Won't you come now as we together stand and sing the song of invitation. Careless soul, why will you linger? Wandering from the full of God. Heed not the invitation, oh, prepare to meet thy God. Careless soul, Oh, God.